Welcome to the Psychedelia Podcast, where we talk about the third wave of psychedelics. Through our many wide-ranging conversations with scientists, policymakers, entrepreneurs, and event organizers, we bring you an exclusive look into the many minds of the psychedelic world. It's time to let the word out about psychedelics and how they can be used as tools to benefit both the individual and the community. Welcome to the third wave. Hey fellow Psychonauts and welcome back to the Psychedelia Podcast. On today's episode we have a super interesting guest. His name is Danny Nemu, also called Reverend Nemu. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And Reverend Nemu, he's a character. He's he's an interesting guy. I had a lot of fun speaking with him about drugs in the Bible. Yes, drugs in the Bible. So what drugs were in the Bible? How were those used? How do those affect consciousness? We get a little bit into politics and hierarchy, but we mostly focus the conversation on drugs in the Bible and also some of Danny's personal explorations with psychedelic substances. So I'm going to read a brief bio about Danny. But before I do that, I just want to say two things. First, if you are enjoying this podcast, you think it's cool, if you like it, please leave a review on iTunes for us or Google or Stitcher, you know, however you're accessing this, please leave a review. It means a lot to us and it helps us to spread our message even further. It takes two minutes, maybe three minutes. Yeah, just go ahead and pause the podcast right now and leave a review. We would really, really appreciate it. The second thing is we've launched our forum at The Third Wave, forum.thethirdwave.co. Right now it focuses on microdosing, but we are probably going to expand that to include all of psychedelic culture. And so just go on over there, you know, take a second and register. It's not really up and going yet, at least as of this date, February 25, 2017, but it's going to get going in the next month or so. So I encourage you to go over to forum.thethirdwave.co and check that out. I would love to just interact with you guys over there on the forum. So let's get into a brief bio about Danny and then we'll start the podcast. Danny's background is in the history and philosophy of medicine from the University of Manchester. He first encountered ayahuasca when living in Japan. After six years drinking there with the Santa Daime group, he followed the trail back to its source in the Brazilian Amazon, where he was bitten by a sandfly, leading to a Leishmaniasis infection. This highly aggressive bacterial parasite quickly colonized a few inches of his skin, with designs and much more, improved to be a great teacher, providing ample opportunity to study firsthand the intricacies and potencies of ayahuasca as used as a medicine within the daime worldview. The process took eight months, involving diets and barks, many rituals, and daily consumption of the visionary brew. By the end of it, he had lost 10 kilos and gained a deep respect for the complexity and intelligence of the natural world. He speaks often, loudly, and with received pronunciation about the history of science, the science of ayahuasca, and plenty of other things, including drugs and consciousness in the Bible. So guys, enjoy this podcast. I can't wait for you to hear it. So Danny, <laughs> thanks so much for, for being on, on the show with us. You know, I think because we are talking about drugs and consciousness and the Bible, the first question that I have is, was Moses tripping on psychedelics when he saw the burning bush? I think that is the most pressing question that I can ask for you to begin with. Well, that's a big question to begin with. <laughs> so that burning bush is sneh in Hebrew, and it's it seems to be one of the acacias, which is quite interesting in itself, acacia being the highest concentration of DMT in the region. And whether he was tripping when he saw that is, is kind of up for debate, really, because Moses heard voices and was filled with compulsions all over the place. What is quite interesting is when everyone else saw the vision on the mountain, which is where the bush, you know, the, the, his vision of the bush, it kind of got him to go and get the to rescue the Israelites and take them on a journey which ended up at the mountain. It's the one part in the Bible where everybody sees something together, like normally prophets see things on their own. And in fact, we know that people who are not on psychedelics hear voices and see things. We might pathologize them and say they're hallucinating, which is another question. But there's no other place in the Bible. In fact, there's almost no other place in world religion where a whole bunch of people see something at the same time. And that is at the foot of the mountain. And they not only see something, but um, I'm going to read the line to you. It says, and all the people are seeing the voices and the flames and the sound of the trumpet. 
Uh, we don't normally see voices and we don't normally see the sound of a trumpet unless we are having a synesthetic experience, which is something which happens on acid and on other, on other psychedelics, as, as, as I'm sure you're aware. So the other interesting thing about that particular point is that this is the only time, well, this vision happens when everybody is eating manna together. And it looks like manna is a psychoactive could it be that that manna is like a mushroom? Would that be a viable kind of explanation? I don't, I don't think manna is a mushroom. Personally, I think it's ergot. And so I do think it's a fungus, but there's quite a lot of description in Exodus about what it looks like. For example, it forms pellets the size of coriander seed and they're white. And it also forms a kind of, it's described as a hoarfrost. So it just, it, it forms a very thin frost on the ground. And that sounds very much like a secretion, a plant secretion. You can imagine a, a, a plant secretion hardening on the plant and forming little pellets and dripping onto the ground and forming this kind of uh, very thin carpet. And a lot of the other things in Exodus also point to ergot. Like, for example, it's described as having the taste of honey and wafers. And the first stage of infection, ergot does produce a honeydew, which has the taste of honey. And then it quickly rots. And Moses says to the people, he says, tomorrow is Sabbath. So today, gather all you need to gather and don't keep anything for tomorrow. And if you do, it's going to stink. Well, the people who, who did, they found that it was full of worms and it stunk, which is it seems to be a quite accurate if you're talking about ergot because ergot very rapidly decays and the other thing about ergot is that it needs to be prepared if you want to make a viable psychedelic out of it first you've got to grind it up and then you've got to boil it up and then you've got to separate the soluble part which is trippy but not poison and that's exactly what they're told to do in fact they're told to grind it up and then they're told to boil it so the preparation given in exodus about manna is, it looks like it, it, it could well be ergot, but I guess one thing you need to bear in mind here is that clearly I'm speculating about what that thing is. There are plenty of drugs in the Bible which don't require any speculation at all. They're uh, identified and they're known to science as being powerful and safe psychedelics. And I want to get into those drugs in a little bit, you know, those those drugs that are hidden in, in plain sight, so to say. But before we get into that, how did you ever become interested in in this topic? Because, you know, I find it to be fascinating myself. I come from a fairly church-oriented upbringing, and I'm quite familiar with the Bible and all of its, not all of its intricacies, but many of its intricacies. And I had discussions in the past with friends about Moses and the burning bush and manna and these other substances, but the depth at which you've gone into these things, I find to be astounding. It really is. Yeah, I think astounding is the best word. It's just there, there's so much that we don't know, actually, that we haven't really been taught or that hasn't been brought to our attention about drugs in the Bible. So like, what's your path? Like, did you drink ayahuasca and you got into psychedelics and then you got into the Bible or, you know, what was that path like for you in getting into this? Yeah, I mean, everyone's got to have a hobby, and I really like psychedelics. I find them fascinating. So, yeah, I was uh, tripping before I was interested in the Bible. I guess I'm interested in poetry as well, and I read the Bible primarily as, as poetry, and I think it's some of the most extraordinary poetry ever written, generally poorly translated. But um, if you have a bit of a handle on Hebrew, then you can get a whole lot out of it. My interest in the Bible started because well, it started like this. I was visited by the Jehovah's Witnesses when I was at university and I needed to come up with a, a dissertation. In fact, I was sitting in my house. I'd been smoking ganja and they arrived at my door and I just found them fascinating, the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, an apocalyptic cult. And my academic background is the history and philosophy of science and medicine. And I was interested primarily or initially in their take on medicine, because, as you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they refuse to have blood transfusions and so on and so forth. And anyway, that kind of went on and on. My study into them and apocalyptic cults in general deepened. But I started getting interested in, in certain bits of the Bible. One, one bit which really caught my imagination was a line from Matthew, where it says at the end of the world, basically at the end of the world, everything will go wrong and there'll be wailing and, and so on and so forth. Now, I had a, having a look at that translation, it doesn't actually say at the end of the world. It says at the end of the aeon, which is something very much different, the end of the epoch. And when the Bible was translated, the King James Version Bible was translated, 
King James himself really didn't want people running around talking about the end of the Aeon, the end of the epoch, because it was a very tense time in English history. And we're in a pretty tense time at the moment as well. But you had the Puritans and they were kicking off revolutionary revolutionary philosophy. So I, so I got into the, so I started looking at mistranslation in the Bible, actually, looking at how the Bible has been used as a tool of of political control, if you like. So that was my interest in the Bible. But that quickly developed into an interest in the poetry of it. I mean, it's it's a fascinating document, and it goes very deeply into the psychology of people. Now, the thing about drugs in the Bible itself, I'm not actually sure. I was trying to think about what the first one I found. I think I might have read somewhere or heard somewhere that frankincense is a tranquilizer, and I looked into that. In fact, I ate some, which is always the best thing to do with, with drugs. <laughs> First-hand um, experience there, right? Yeah. But need to be careful with your dose. Probably around the size of a pea is a good dose of frankincense. And it's lovely. It's really, really nice. You want to chew it up and eventually you might spit it out or you can swallow it. It goes like a kind of chewing gum in your mouth. So having, having established that frankincense was, a, was psychoactive, was a tranquilizer, it works on the GABA system, I then started going through all the drugs in the Bible. So, yeah, you know, we can, we can get on to all that kind of stuff. But there's just loads of them. And they are in the most exalted places in the Bible. They're often described as having high value. So, for example, there's this line, there's this bit where Jesus has his feet washed and Judas complains about the fact that they're wasting money on spikenard, which they're using to wash his feet. Now, spikenard is a dopamine booster and a serotonin booster and a GABA booster. And it's described as a neurotropic, which means it assists in the formation of memories. So I kind of found it really interesting because, you know, as you say, mainstream Christian thought doesn't really acknowledge them. It doesn't really notice them and wouldn't really imagine that there are any drugs in the Bible, perhaps. But from in, in Jewish thought, there's no drugs, which are, or there's no plants which are not kosher. There's loads of things which aren't kosher, which are not, not allowed to have. But plants aren't among them, which is quite an interesting place to start whenever plants are mentioned in the bible they're good things in psalms it says that they are for the service of man for example it says that the plants are for cattle to eat and they're for the service of man so the service of man that's quite a broad quite a broad topic you know it could be for construction it could be for medicine and of course it could be for drugs and i think those those can be one and two in the same thing like drugs and medicine are are, are often closely related now i i want to kind of go back into a point that you had made which was getting into this original translation and how some of the original translations of the Bible, you know, they were maybe affected by a heavy bias in terms of when you had people in the 18th century or 17th century or 16th century, or even, you know, the Council of Nicaea in in 300 AD when they got together and decided what would be in the Bible, what wouldn't be in there. Can you expand a little bit on that in terms of the way that the Bible was translated and how it was translated in a way that was made it easier to control groups of people? Yeah, I mean, the Council of Nicaea, that's when they, well, you got the book being put together by a chap by the name of Irenaeus, Irenaeus of Leon. That happened a little bit before, and a whole lot of the, what's now called the Gnostic Gospels were pushed out of the Bible, and we got left with, certainly in the, in the New Testament, we got some stories which don't go into the immaterial very far. So to give you an example, there's stories where Jesus walks and doesn't leave any footprints, and there's the Gospel of Mary, for example, where Jesus appears in a vision and says something along the lines of don't accept any law from the lawgivers. So all that kind of stuff was was pushed out. The translation of the Hebrew, I mean, they weren't really interested. Who was it? It's Geronimo, St. Geronimo. He said he described the prophets as rude and repellent. He wasn't particularly interested in the Old Testament, what the Old Testament prophets had to say, I guess, on some level. So then you go into Paul, they they constructed the Bible, the Bible was constructed in a certain way as to become quite an authoritarian document, I guess it's fair to say. The translation, you know, went through a whole series of translations. The translation that we tend to have now is the King James Version. And yeah, as I say, written in a very a very difficult period of, of English history. And the translation didn't actually do any good in the end. There still was that Puritan revolution and they kind of lost control of that one. But we, we ended up with the same chamomile, I shouldn't call it chamomile. It's a very beautiful, it's got some beautiful poetry in it, even in the English translation. But yeah, that's where that goes. But having said that, the drugs are not hidden. Well, there may be one that gets hidden or perhaps mistranslation, mistranslated, and that's uh, Cane Bossum. Cane Bossum, you'll notice it sounds very much like cannabis. In fact, in the, in the singular, it is. It's Cane Boss. 
Now that's translated as calamus in the in the King James Version. Calamus is a reed, but we know it can't be a reed. For one thing, canair means cane, and cane isn't reed. And also we know that it was used on the shirts that they that the Jews used to bury their dead in. And of course, a shirt made out of reeds would decompose in a matter of days, whereas a shirt made out of cannabis or, or cane uh, wouldn't decompose so quickly. I think that was basically a mistake, that particular translation, rather than a piece of political intrigue. Interesting. And, and so is that the, the only mistake then that, that was in the Bible? Would you, or would you say there, there were obviously various other mistakes that, that maybe we don't know about from a translation perspective? Oh, but there's loads. I mean, uh, the meek shall inherit the earth. That's quite an interesting one. That word inherit is almost never translated as inherit. Normally it's translated as seize. And that word meek doesn't really mean meek. It means poor. So that would be translated uh, more normally. If you, if you look at how the words are normally used as the poor shall seize the, the land, not the earth, the land. So that kind of describes political occupations, for example, for one thing, there's people who need land and they are taking it. The meek shall inherit the earth is an entirely different vision of perhaps people waiting quietly until they are given what they want, which is, of course, very useful to the powers that be and the powers of empire. Precisely. Yeah. And I, th- I think this is an interesting topic in itself in terms of the patriarchy that, that has come out about as a result of some of these values that started with the Hebraic tribes and eventually kind of made their way into Christianity and into the Bible. And the you know aggrandizement of, of power is, is obviously such an integral part of more mainstream dogmatic religion that you know paying attention to these little things is, is a really good way of kind of waking up to some of these things, especially if they haven't been brought to our attention before. And obviously, another critical aspect of that of that sense of, of waking up or becoming aware is these drugs that were obviously talked about in the Bible and that were hidden in plain sight, so to say. So let's kind of move the conversation then in that direction, because I think that's what I'm interested in. That's what probably our listeners are interested in is what are the drugs in the Bible? What, you know, you mentioned cannabis, you had mentioned frankincense. What are some, you'd mentioned the acacia which has DMT in it. What are some of these other manna as well? What are some of these other drugs that are kind of in the Bible and written about? Okay, so let's begin by looking at the ones which are definitely there. You know, manna, manna I've got some ideas about, cannabosum, there's a whole lot of research there, but that's one which, like we say, it hasn't been translated clearly, or we're not absolutely sure about the, about the translation there. But here's a line from the Song of Songs. Thy plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, camphire with spicanard, spicanard and saffron, cane and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and agar wood, with all the chief spices, right? So that's a paradisical garden described in the Song of Songs. So we look at some of those plants there. Camphire is one that isn't psychoactive, or at least we don't think it's psychoactive. That's, that's henna. But all the other ones there that have been identified have psychoactive properties. So frankincense, we already talked about. Frankincense works on, it's a GABA receptor agonist, and it also works on what's on the TRPV3 iron channel. And that's an iron channel which is distributed throughout the body. In the skin, it seems to be related to temperature, the sense of temperature. And it's also distributed quite widely in the brain, and the brain, we've got no idea what it does. So that's, uh, that's an interesting one, that one. Like you say, that's been burned for a long time. It was burned to Baal before it was burned to Yahweh, and he was the Canaanite god, and before that it was burned to Ra as well, the Egyptian god. And that was transported for a, a massive distance, actually. It was 1,500 miles. It was a six-month trek by camel to get this stuff from Oman to, to Palestine. So they went to a great deal of trouble to get this stuff. And, you know, if you're thinking about it just because it smells nice, would they, would they really bother to go to all that, all that trouble? So that was frankincense. Myrrh is another one. Obviously, the three wise men, they bought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So myrrh works on the opioid system. It works. It's a mu and delta opioid agonist. So both of these things are tranquilizers. The GABA system, by the way, GABA receptors, the most common receptors in the brain, and every neuron either has GABA receptors or is next door to a neuron which has GABA receptors. It's it's where Valium works on the brain. Uh, Opioid receptors, uh, obviously, is where opium and some other things like that work on. So, uh, yeah, so that's myrrh. It was, it's it's classed as a tranquilizer. It's also anxiolytic. It works against anxiety, works against depression. It's offered to Christ on the cross in 
in wine, but he refuses it, perhaps to keep his head clear. It's not made clear why he decides to refuse it. So those are the big ones, myrrh and frankincense. But there's, there's plenty more. That one, saffron, for example, that's another GABA agonist. That's the stigma of the crocus sativus plant. That's an interesting one because that also comes into the Islamic tradition. In Islamic jurisprudence, saffron is called one of the drugs that cause joy. It was one of the ones that was allowed to be taken by, by Muslims. It's described, I haven't taken it myself, sadly, but it's described as like opium. And Pliny said it was an aphrodisiac. In fact, he said it has a gentle effect on the head and wets the sex drive. What else have we got? Agar wood, that's sedative and analgesic. Cinnamon is fascinating because that contains eugenol. It contains saffron as well, which is in saffron, but it also contains eugenol. And eugenol is what you make MDMA out of. If you neck a whole load of cinnamon, you're probably not, not going to have a, an MDMA experience. But the way that these things are combined in, into preparation reveals a very advanced knowledge of psychopharmacology or herbalism. One of those preparations is the massage oil, it's the holy anointing oil, Shemen Hamishcha. And that's where we get the word uh, Mashiach, which is the anointed one. And that's also where we get the word um, Messiah from. So Messiah back in the day was a king who had been anointed with this stuff. And mashach is also where we get the word massage from. So the anointing, you might imagine it as being poured on someone's head, but it doesn't seem to be that at all. It comes from the verb, which means to wipe or to paint. And it seems that the priests and the kings were massaged with this stuff, right? What did that contain? It contained myrrh, which we talked about. It contained cinnamon, which we talked about. And it contained caner bosom. Caner bosom... We talked about that briefly. It looks very much like it's cannabis. If we look into the research of Sula Bennett, for example, or also Chris Bennett, he wrote a whole book about this kind of thing. The nearby tribes, they also use cannabis. The Scythians, for example, they were visited by Herodotus in about 500 BC, and he describes how they pin the flaps of their tents down, and then they throw cannabis on fire, and immediately it smokes and gives out such a vapour as no Grecian vapour bath can exceed the Sith's delighted shout for joy. That's called cannabis. So all the tribes around that place had a word for cannabis, and it's been found on Ramesses II's mummy, for example, in Egypt. And to get to Egypt, it had to go through Palestine. Palestine was on the major trade route on the way. And in fact, cannabosum is described as from a far place in the Bible. So back to the massage oil, we've got myrrh, we've got cannabosum, we've got cinnamon, and then we've got cassia, which is called Chinese cinnamon. It's used a lot in Chinese medicine. And that contains estrogel, which is described as having electric LSD-like effects. Now, as I said, these things won't have any effect if you just eat them. But what you have to do is knock out your enzymes, a bit like the way that ayahuasca works if you just eat a spoonful of DMT, you're not really going to notice it. You have to inhibit your monoamine oxidase enzymes, and that's what the harmaline and the harmine do, although they do do other things as well, but let's not go into that story. So, yeah, so the P, so, so you've got this whole enzyme system, it's called the P450 system, and that contains a whole series of enzymes. One of them is a CYP2A6 enzyme, another one's a CYP2E1 enzyme. Both of those are blocked by cinnamon. And others of these are blocked by other things that was in the Shemen Hamishach, the Shemen Hamishcha, the massage or the anointing oil. Something which has a similar chemical profile to it with these allobenzenes, with these chemicals, is nutmeg. And nutmeg is quite curious in that if you take a large dose of that, it will have quite a powerful effect if you have the right enzyme profile. But that's because it contains both powerful psychoactives, but also the enzyme inhibitors. So it does both at the same time. But nutmeg grows, or it used to grow, on a tiny little island out in the middle of nowhere. So the, the Israelites didn't know about that. But they did, I think they inherited this recipe from Egypt, in fact, because the mixture of myrrh and cinnamon and cassia was known to the pharaohs. It was what the Egyptian apothecaries used to mix up to massage into the pharaohs. So the priests and the kings were obliged to have this stuff massaged onto themselves. Here's a line from the Bible. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the spirit of Yahweh came upon David from that, way, from that day forward. And so is that basically saying that, that he was seeing God after, after tripping out? Yeah, I would say that's pretty much. Uh, oh, so, well, it's not. It's not acacia. There's no reference to acacia being taken in the Bible. Although, of course, there's loads of stuff that was was wasn't written down in the Bible. But no, it's this mix of myrrh, cane, cinnamon, and cassia. 
Yeah, it looks like, I don't know, we need to have, there's a bit of a caution there in that you might think that Yahweh is a product of allyl benzene chemistry. And I don't really think that's fair on Yahweh. I wear glasses. I've actually lost my glasses at the moment. So everyone's face is blurred. Now, if I put my glasses on, I can start to recognize people. But that doesn't mean to say that those people are a product of my glasses. No, it means that with my glasses, I can see those people. So the kings and the priests, they took, they, they, had, they were anointed with the stuff and actually a whole load of other stuff, which we can go into. It doesn't necessarily mean that Yahweh doesn't exist outside of those stuff. Those, those things. See what I mean? It just means that it's easier to perceive kind of a oneness or or the or kind of in touch with that sense of spirituality for those people who are being anointed with, with the substances. Well, I'll tell you what, Yahweh, oneness isn't really Yahweh's bag, to be honest. Yahweh is fierce and scary. He's a war god. He's described as a man of war in the Bible. And there's quite an interesting Eroid report from somebody who who, he took a mixture of nutmeg and myrrh. Now, if you take nutmeg and myrrh together, you've got loads of the chemicals that are in that anointing oil. He took that from the Kala Chakra Tantra, which is, a, which is an Indian text. And he described his experience. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, gonna to find it and describe it to you because it's, it's really fascinating. This guy, as far as I know, had no idea that he was taking something chemically similar to what the priests and the kings would have taken back in the day in Israel. But here, listen to this. He, so he describes it. Actually, he fell asleep and then he woke up. And this is what happens. Awakening as if possessed by a fierce and aggressive deity, deep monstrous voice boiling out of me, unbidden, etc. Open-eyed visions and closed-eyed visions of a bulging-eyed, white-skinned man in ceremonial armor. The real world perceived as a faraway and distorted window. This window also emanated and originated a mental fireball or supernova. This fireball had as its identity the fierce deity above. My voice seemed to penetrate the walls and echo off the sky. New doors, avenues opened up inside familiar mantra. New knowledge disclosed, new perspectives on hidden meanings. So we're not really talking about a chilled out vision of, of oneness here. We're talking about a fierce an aggressive deity, which Yahweh certainly is, if you read his stories, and also this idea he talks about penetrating the walls and this, this kind of thing. This is what the apocalypse is. Apocalypse is a Greek word, and it means the the lifting of the veil. So it's where the walls collapse. It's where it's where we see things that we couldn't previously see. New doors opened up inside familiar mantra. New knowledge disclosed. So he's discovering things through this mix of chemicals, through this mix of plants. And that was very much what the Shemen Hamishcha, what the anointing oil was meant to do. It was meant to give you a direct experience of Yahweh and also wisdom, because the way it was used back in the day is that the priests would take it inside a tabernacle or they would be anointed with it inside the tabernacle and they would come out with information for the tribe, with new insights that they could use for the tribe. So back in the day, the shaman from whatever culture you look at, the shaman, one of his jobs was divination and particularly war divination. So he was called upon to know when to attack the enemy, you know, when to hide, all these kind of things. And that's one of the things that Moses does when he goes into the tabernacle. He is anointed with oil and he also has a smoke bath in the back room of the tabernacle, which is a hot box, basically. We can talk about that in a moment. And then he comes out with instructions for the tribe. Yeah. So what's his name? Strassman wrote a really interesting book about this, uh, and DMT, The Soul of Prophecy, it's called. And uh, although he doesn't think that there are drugs in the Bible, or he certainly doesn't, he's not forthcoming with that information, he does make the case that the Old Testament view of relationship with these entities is quite different to the Zen style merging with oneness, to all that, all that jazz. And so, and so, you know, when you're when you're talking about these. In seemingly psychedelic states with with what's happening with with the massaging oils and the anointing and kind of the the lifting of the veil, so to say, with with these apocalyptic visions. Are there any other particular instances in the Bible that read as religious visions, but that you perceive as being potentially psychedelic substances? Any other major stories that we would be familiar with, or generally people would be familiar with? Mm. Yeah, it's an interesting question. The prophets don't seem to be taking anything, and Strassman makes that point quite clear. They have their visions on their own, and they are stimulated by things like asana, certain ways of certain postures, for example, or fasts, or sexual abstinence, or just sadness. They seem to come on either spontaneously or provoked by those kind of practices, as, as they do in kind of um, amongst yogis. 
although not all yogis, of course. The use of, of, of psychoactive agents, and there's, there's a couple of places where it is, but the main area where you see it is in, an, is in the tabernacle which was the exclusive domain of the priests. No one else was allowed in there. So the priests, that was a caste. It was the, the priestly caste, was, was, one, was one of the tribes, if you like. And then everybody else was not allowed in there. And what went on there was very psychoactive. You had this, yeah, you, you had, uh, for example, you had something called the showbread, le, uh, lechem hapanim is in Hebrew. And this is it's described in the Talmud in, in, in rather interesting terms because well, Maimonides, who's a great Jewish sage, he, he was baffled by this. He, he wrote a book called The Guide for the Perplexed, which is a kind of explanation of Jewish bits and bobs, Jewish culture, really. And he said he had no idea what was going on with the showbread. But there's this great bit of the Talmud, I'm going to read it to you. It says, in high priest Simeon the upright's time, a blessing was sent into the Omer, the two loaves of bread, and the showbread, and every priest who received only the size of an olive became satiated, and some was left over. So they're eating the size of an olive, and they're becoming satiated, and that's plenty. And it goes on. But after him, these things were cursed, and every priest got only the size of a bean, and the delicate priest refused to take it altogether. But the voracious ones accepted and consumed it once happened, one took his own chair and his fellows, he was nicknamed robber until his death. So there you've got something, the dosage is the size of a bean, and that is too much for some people. So we're not talking about sandwiches here, we're talking about doses. Like frankincense, would, it, would that be like, because you said before that in terms of like, when you eat frankincense or when you chew it, it's a very tiny amount, or, or would it be something else, possibly like the ergot, or you know, yeah. what, what would you assume that it would be, what would be the substance? Well, in the Bible, it doesn't say. It does say that it's served up with frankincense. So I think it has frankincense in it. We've got to bear in mind that these guys were absolute masters. They're masters of plants, basically. They really knew what they were doing. It doesn't say in the Bible what the showbread was, what it had in it. But the secret of making it was jealously guarded by the Korahite clan. In fact, the Korahites had to look after all the psychoactive things in the tabernacle. So they were the ones who made the wine. And of course, back in the day, well, wine is psychoactive anyway, but back in the day, wine was often used to infuse other things in, in, in cultures all over the world. And they were also charged with making the, the incense, the temple incense, the Ketoret Hasamim. Now in the Bible, that is described as having stacta, onica, galbanum, and frankincense in it. We talked about frankincense. Galbanum is another gab agonist, another tranquilizer. Stacta, we're not sure, but quite a few ancient authors describe it as high-grade myrrh. And then onica, again, not sure about that. It looks like it was a, a shell. Now those are the things which are described in the Bible. But then if you look in the Talmud, which is a, a first century collection of Jewish folklore and law and uh, repository of culture, or well, the oral tradition of the Jews of the Israelites was recorded into the Talmud. And that describes a whole load of other ingredients. And some of those are we've already talked about, like cassia, Chinese cinnamon, spikenard, which was the dopamine booster, a saffron, which works on the opioid system, costus and myrrh and cinnamon, but then there's other ones as well. There's uh, Jordan Amber, and there's Kashina Lai, and there's Aromatic Bark, and there's Cypress Wine, and there's Sodom Salt, and there's something called Nebtadini Pyrotechnica, which is that which causes the smoke to rise. And that's quite interesting as well, because... So what happens is the tabernacle is a, is a tent in the, that the Israelites carry around the desert, right? And the tabernacle has two chambers, that's two parts of it. And the back end of the tabernacle is a four and a half meter cubed chamber, right? The tabernacle is described in intricate detail in the Bible. It gets five and a half chapters, whereas like the Ten Commandments gets get about half a chapter, just to put that into context. And it's described, everything about it is described, how many pegs hold down the, uh, the coverings and how many coverings. There's four skins, or there's four coverings rather, which are pulled tight over a frame made of acacia. Two of those coverings are skins. One of them was known to be a really thick skin because it was the same stuff that they made shoes out of. And then there's another skin, and then there's two, there's two more as well. So you've got a veil, which is at the front of the tabernacle, and that keeps wandering eyes out of the tabernacle because they're doing all kinds of things in there. But then at the back of the tabernacle, you've got another veil. And this veil, certainly in the temple time, was described as the thickness of a man's hand span, right? So the question arises, why would you need such a thick veil at the back of the tabernacle? What were they trying to keep in? The idea is that Yahweh himself descends upon that part of the tabernacle. But, you know, Yahweh is not going to be kept in by a tent. Um, what would be kept in by a tent is smoke. And 
here's another line. He shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before Yahweh, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. So we're talking about the second veil. So what happens is you get all these 16 or so psychoactive ingredients, you beat them very, very small, and then you take handfuls of these and put them on a censer inside this back chamber of the tabernacle. It's called the Holy of Holies in Jewish scripture. And there, what, what do you have? You've got the magic box, you've got the, the Ark of the Covenant, and then you've got the censer, which you use to burn incense. And that's all you've got in the back of the tabernacle. And the only thing you're meant to do there is burn incense and talk to angels and have visions. And then the, and the only person who would go then there was the high priest. So the, the, everyone else was not allowed in that particular room. And then when the high priest came out, he would come out with information for the tribe. And it might be information of how to cure something or where they should go next or who they should attack next or so on and so forth. So the setup for that particular ritual is very much the, a similar setup to what happens in shamanic societies. The, the shaman generally goes off on his own or on her own and goes to their hut and they take their mushrooms or they take their ayahuasca whilst they're surrounded by magical objects. And then when they're done with talking to their familiar spirits, they come back to the tribe and they give information. And that's kind of the parallel that I was drawing in my mind as you were discussing this and as you were talking about this. Yet, I think a lot of people in our mainstream culture today, they perceive the use of ayahuasca in these Amazonian regions, for example, as being part of a, a primitive ritual and, and to suggest that our ancestors, you know, our cultural ancestors did something similar. It's, it's heretical, so to say. There's probably quite a few people, especially people who consider themselves to be of the Christian faith that would obviously push back on a number of these fronts that you're speaking of. Can you talk a little bit about that? What kind of resistance do you meet from evangelicals or, or other people of the Christian faith when you discuss these topics, if you discuss these topics with them? I would be delighted to meet some more spirited resistance, really. When I was, um, I've written a book called Neuro Apocalypse, and one of the chapters is called Exodrugs, and that's where all, all of this stuff comes in. And I wanted to get this looked over by an evangelical guy. So I selected this guy, he's from the Tectonic website, and he writes, he's a Christian apologist, and he writes quite well on things like you know, when people draw connections between pagan gods and Jesus Christ and stuff. This is the guy who goes online and writes essays about why they, where their mistakes are. So I wanted, well, to be blunt, I wanted to use his mind as a way to tie up my research, basically, to, to make sure there weren't any foolish mistakes in it. And so I wrote to him, pretending to be a concerned Christian, worried about what this awful Reverend Emu was writing and saying, and how the youngsters of my church were smoking all, all kinds of things and saying it was in the Bible. But I really had to provoke this guy. It took a little while to get him to comment on the thing. The first thing he said was, oh, no, no, just ignore it. There's nothing there. And I wrote back, incensed, and said, look, all the kids in my church are smoking themselves silly. You're not going to need to say. So I finally managed to provoke this guy into a response. And he wrote, it was kind of disappointing, really. I'll give you an example of one of the things he said. I, I, was, I was talking about mandrakes. Like, there's a, there's a bit in the Bible where the two wives of Jacob, one of them goes to get some mandrakes, and the other one says, give me some of those mandrakes. And the one says, I'll tell you what, I'll give you some of these mandrakes if you let me sleep with our husband tonight. So there's a value attached to these mandrakes. Now, so this guy came back to me and he said, well... Uh, well, he didn't come back to me. He published it on his newsletter. And he said, just because a DIY manual mentions the use of paint thinner doesn't say that it's recommending that you use it to get high. He was suggesting that mandrakes can be used for something else. Now, mandrakes, well, for one thing, his Hebrew is pretty rotten because mandrakes in Hebrew is dudai. And dudai comes from the word dud, and dud means beloved. And mandrakes, of course, are well known as an aphrodisiac, as well as giving you visions. So that's one area where he was just kind of, it was, a, it was a poor attack, really. The other thing is that mandrakes, you've got to be very, very careful with the dose. If you take a small amount, it's described as euphoric. If you take a little bit too much, and we're talking, you know, an, another teaspoon here, is described as, someone wrote on, er on Eroid, erotic delirium, and described having terrifying, sexy dreams. And then if you take much more than that, well, then you're having muco-bloody dysentric discharges. So 
it, it's not really a thing which can be used as a food stuff. It's a rubbish food stuff. It's an excellent aphrodisiac and it's an excellent, it's an excellent visionary plant, but really not very good food stuff. So that guy was kind of disappointing. And I would love to get some traction with uh, Christian evangelists. Unfortunately, in England, we don't really have that kind of Christian right wing fire and brimstone stuff in the same way that you do have in the States. I would love those guys. I'd love to go jousting against these guys. It'd be a whole load of fun for me, but sadly it hasn't happened. So, you know, if you can send some my way, I would uh, love to get my teeth into them. Well, and have you received any other pushback or resistance from even those who maybe are Christian who just question some of your sourcing or question some of the conclusions that you've drawn? Have you received uh, any, any type of criticism like that? There's not much criticism to make. I mean, the Bible, if you're Christian, the Bible is the word of God. And so they can't question my source there. It's the Bible. And so you look at the plants and it's simple pharmacology. You know, the stuff has been, well, it's been investigated in two ways. Stuff has been distilled and looked at. And then these things have been fed to rats and they've done all kinds of nasty things to rats. And well, of course, it's much better just to eat them. But we have established by being very mean to rats that these things are sensitive, are analgesic, are tranquilizers are antidepressants or whatever. So there's, they don't really have a leg to stand on, to be honest. The thing about Canair Bossum, for example, the evidence is overwhelming, but I wouldn't push that too far because they could say, I mean, there, there is an argument there that it's not cannabis. It just happens to be called Canair Bossum and it's a cane. Canair Bossum, by the way, means fragrant or resinous cane. And of course, cannabis is a fragrant and a resinous cane. So I would look forward to some more fighting. And yeah, I would as well, just because I think there would be interesting and backlash. And maybe if any listeners are hearing this right now and they can think of any individuals who we could you know, screen this with, I'd be really interested to see how, how people do respond and react. And I think I would be interested as you would, I'm sure Danny as well, because we live in a culture today that has been so influenced by certain puritanical values that are supposedly derived from Christianity. And of course, one of those big things is, you know, just saying no to drugs and all drugs are bad, except of course, alcohol and tobacco. And so, or pharmaceuticals for that matter. So I think we have this kind of inbred resistance to drugs. And I would be interested to see how people would change or if they would change, if they understood that the very culture that we have built our civilization on has this extensive history of drug use. Yeah. So going back to the Bible, those drugs were controlled back in the day. They were only to be taken by the priests. Going back further than that, we don't really know. We do know that other people were using them. Certainly this Mandrake story makes it pretty clear that Mandrakes were into them. But if you look all, the, all through Jewish history as well, you've got some great rabbinical authorities, for example, saying things along the lines of describing their own drug use, saying that certain drugs which they have access to have the same effect as manna which is to cause them to have knowledge of higher things. So this is um, mainstream Jewish thought. And in fact, there was a particular, what is his name, Rabbi Kaplan, describes one of the Kabbalistic meditations with certain grasses. And he says there's good evidence of those grasses being psychoactive. So in, certainly in Jewish history, there's no great taboo against drugs. And like I say, you know, pork is not kosher. There's certain textiles which aren't kosher. There's certain times that you can't do certain things. But there's no restrictions on drugs except things like you're not allowed to mix up the massage oil unless you're a priest. So what I would say is, if people are interested in this, just do go easy on the dose because just because these things are natural doesn't mean to say they're not powerful. So back in the day in Exodus, for example, there were taboos on these things the priests advise not to take strong drink or wine before they go into the tabernacle because they're going to be anointed with the oil. And also, once they've been anointed with the oil, they're not allowed out of the tabernacle. The line goes, do not leave the tabernacle lest ye die. So, you know, like today, if you're going to be taking stuff, don't get wrecked beforehand and don't go stumbling through the streets afterwards. A safe setting is probably conducive to a good experience, I would imagine, mm. and, and being mm. responsible. And this, I was just thinking of a question. One, have you ever done some of these yourself? Have you ever made some of these mixes, some of these massage oils yourself using these raw ingredients? Yeah, I've had a go with the massage oil. And yeah, it was certainly pleasant. I haven't 
you've got to got to bear in mind that the particular enzyme profile that I have as a Caucasian is quite different to the enzyme profile that a Middle Eastern or well, an Israelite, well, what are we talking about, two and a half thousand odd years ago had. We've all got different enzymes. And I think that this particular mixture is particularly good for that profile. Certainly, I've tried with some enthusiasm, haven't quite managed. I mean, I've got something out of it, but I haven't had a, a meeting with, with Yahweh with Yahweh yet. But I did have someone, someone came to a talk I gave, and he had read He'd read an article I'd written on this kind of stuff, and he'd mixed up the stuff. And him and his girlfriend had, had massaged each other with it, and they had a marvelous time. So, yeah, Be, um, because of the nice. because of the drug, or because they were massaging each other. No, no, no. Well, maybe they. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> they said they definitely got something out of it. And in fact, the yeah. whole next day they were feeling amazing as well. But yeah, eating eating frankincense, eating myrrh. Yeah, that, that definitely go easy on eating myrrh, by the way. But that definitely has an effect. The effect of myrrh, uh, sorry, the effect of frankincense and cannabosum and cannabis together is is really wonderful, actually. It's, it's very pleasant. It kind of, I've got a friend who gets a bit paranoid when she smokes. But as she said, when she ate frankincense before smoking, that paranoia didn't happen, which is quite interesting because frankincense is traditionally used to keep bad spirits away. You know, it's used to purify the place. So that's quite interesting that the paranoia doesn't come when you're using something which is there to keep the bad spirits away. Hmm, I might have to try that myself because when I get really stoned, I also have some paranoia, as many people do, I think, at, at high levels of uh, of cannabis. Yeah, we've got to bear in mind, like modern pharmacology is about isolating potent chemicals and that kind of thing. That wasn't the case back in the day. What they were, what they were interested in is synergies how to make things that have these effects, which is, of course, the, the rainforest traditions. You know, going back to something you said before, people think of it as primitive technologies. These guys really knew what they were doing. They still do know what they're doing. If you go, the, these guys out in the jungle, I lived in the Amazon for about a year. I, had a lot of, I spent a lot of time. I'm, I'm still involved with Santa Daimi. And I got a parasite when I was out there. It's called leishmaniasis. It's a bacterial flesh-eating infection. And it's not meant to be treatable with natural medicines. In fact, everyone around me thought I was crazy for trying to treat it with ayahuasca and i'd spent eight months sick in the jungle treating this with ayahuasca but one of the types of ayahuasca that i, that I used was called nine herb ayahuasca and it's a mixture of, of, of obviously uh, ayahuasca plus nine herbs it's from a different tradition actually it's from the udv tradition but or it's from a guy rather who was who was uh, from the udv and these guys really do know what they're doing. So although those the, the technologies might be old, they're certainly not primitive in the sense that they are not as good as ours. And I think that's a super valid point. And I think we're rediscovering a lot of this primitive knowledge, this tribal knowledge, not only when it comes to psychoactive substances like ayahuasca, but also when it comes to things like diet and exercise and, and the way that we kind of organize society. There's a lot of value to be had in those more primitive way of doing things because they seem to be more in line with our human nature and kind of from an yeah, and also our, and also our human physiolo physiology. You know, if you look into, I, mean, I gave a talk about this. You can find it online. It's called uh, Taboo from the Jungles of the Clinic. But if you look at the the dieta, the kind of things that people were that that shamans or apprentice shamans eat and don't eat before they take ayahuasca. They say know what they're doing. You know, we have this idea that you shouldn't take SSRIs, you shouldn't take antidepressants if you're going to take ayahuasca. And this is a kind of taboo in the West, if you like. If you go along and take ayahuasca, one of the first things they ask you is, are you on antidepressants? Now, there is absolutely no science behind that at all. There was a, a theoretical objection raised by Callaway and Grob back in, I think it was 1986, somewhere around then. No research has been done on that at all. And there have been plenty of people, like the UDV, for example, they've never, they've never kept that taboo. They've had plenty of people who take antidepressants and ayahuasca with absolutely no problem. There's never been a death or even a doubtful or even a doubtful case, even a possible death mixing those two things. So we, you know, with all our kind of fantastic machines and white coats and pills and all this kind of stuff, you know, our sterilized needles and stuff, we reckon we've got a few things figured out. But the level of, of our research is actually pretty basic. And we haven't done any research on these traditional on the traditional dieta, you know, there's no study into should you or should you not have sex before you take ayahuasca. There's no study into whether you should or shouldn't eat pork or those kind of things. But these are, are traditions that are built into the culture of rainforest peoples who've been doing this stuff for hundreds, if not thousands of years. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's steeped in a ritual. It's steeped in tradition. And when you've been doing it for that long, you tend to figure some things out from a trial and error basis that I think even 40 to 50 years of modern science has a hard time approaching. Oh, I mean, that's one way of looking at it. Yeah. But the other way of looking at it is, as the shamans would say, and as Jeremy Narby puts in his books, the plants told them how to do it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, where, how did we discover monoamine oxidase inhibition? That was discovered by, by mistake. In fact, every single psychopharmacological drug which has been discovered has been discovered by mistake. In fact, all of the psychiatry, all the drugs in psychiatry, they've all been discovered by mistake. And it was Professor David Nutt who told me that. So how, how good are we doing? We, we talk about trial and error in the jungle. They wouldn't, they wouldn't agree with that. They say it's because the plants told us or the spirits told us. We don't even have trial and error. We've just got error. That's a really good point. I, I think that's a really good point is, you know, there are epistemology, right? The way that we come to knowledge, it has a lot of gaps that I think we can, I think going forward, there's going to be a, a lot bigger of a push in terms of the source of knowledge that primitive societies have come to understand and a reintegration of that knowledge into more mainstream cultural things as a way to perpetuate healing for individuals yeah. and communities and things like that. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I do think we do need to do the science, but it would be nice if the science occasionally looks back at what these people who've been doing it for hundreds of years were doing and uh, at least started doing some research on those traditional taboo. Yeah, totally. I'm right there with you. So I want to kind of dig into one last question, and that is based on you've done all this research in terms of drugs and consciousness and the Bible, and you obviously live in 2017 in, in London, in our modern society and culture. From your perspective and from all the research that you've done and, and what you've read, why is it that in our culture today, in our, in our Western culture, which has its basis in Christianity in many ways and not every way, but in many ways, why is it that there's still such a taboo around drugs, even if they were used extensively in the Bible? Yeah, good question. So I guess the beginning of that, I'd like to answer that by saying they were used extensively in the Bible by the priests. Correct. And the, yeah, priests correct. Had, mm-hmm. and the priests were those who were called upon to keep the rest of the people in order, right? Other people had experiences of kind of revelatory experiences as well, and they were the prophets. And the prophets often came into conflict with the kings. Over and over again, you see the prophets will say to the people, look, if you keep on doing this, things will go terribly wrong. And we've got scientists who've been saying for decades now, look, if we keep on burning fossil fuels, things will go terribly wrong. And are our rulers listening? Well, no, not really. So we're kind of reading, I mean, I would say that we haven't really understood the lessons of the Bible in a very clever way. We've still got incredibly greedy central government and a whole load of vices like that. So God, you know what? I've just, I was about to start ranting. I've forgotten your question. Can you just tell me again? Just, uh, you know, I was basically asking about why is it that there's such a taboo in, in our modern culture and society around drugs, even if there's all this talk about consciousness and drugs, even if it's just the priestly class in the Bible, it's still in there. Yeah. So if you look back at the Gnostic movements, you had a, a very rapid spread of jewish christian kind of pre-Christian but Christ-influenced Jewish centers around the Mediterranean. And they started to invite Gentiles into their fold, if you like, and they were outside of the control of the empire. And people there were prophesizing of, of their own, and they were, they were their own authorities. In fact, you see Gnostic texts, and they talk about bishops as being dry canals, their authority was came to them through voices that they would hear, and the voices that they would hear through certain channels. So they would they did certain rituals. Some of them are documented as using psychoactives or using plants of some description or other. Now, if you are taking like take the the Gospel of Mary for example, so Mary meets Jesus in a vision. And Jesus says to her, like I said before, do not accept any law that the lawgiver gives unto you. Now, that is really very difficult for a centralized empire to control that kind of thing. If you're taking your instructions from 
invisible entities, whatever they may be, you might be talking about deep levels of your unconscious mind or however you want to deal with that. That's kind of up to you. And you're also saying that the bishops are dry canals and we're not hearing them. Then it's very difficult to control. So you, so along comes St. Paul and St. Paul says, if any of you is spiritual or is a prophet, first you have to understand that these teachings that I am giving you, these are the words of the Lord. Or I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but basically that's what he says. And then you get like you, you come back to it at the council and then the see what happens there is you get the, the creed later, the, the Apostles Creed. The Apostles Creed says, I believe in this, that and the other. I believe in resurrection in the flesh. Why does it say I believe in resurrection in the flesh? Because you must not believe in resurrection in spirit. The idea that Jesus can come back to you in your dreams and in your visions and perhaps on your psychedelic trips is a big problem if you're trying to control people and tell them how to behave. Now, fast forward nearly 2,000 years, you've got the same problem. How do you control people who are taking their authority from their own visions, from what they've learned when they've taken psychedelics and they've discovered, oh, what can we do? We can be nice to each other. We can... I don't know, you've taken them yourself. You know what happens when you take psychedelics. You build a new way of being in the world. And it tends to be a whole lot kinder than the way that we are instructed to behave by the authorities that we that we labor under. So I would say that the answer is that, you know, the, the power structures that we are that are oppressing us and have been oppressing us for many, many, many generations don't really want us to have summers of love again. And so I guess the immediate follow-up question that I have for that is with this kind of re-emergence of psychedelics from a mainstream perspective, will that change the power structure or will, from your perspective, will there be a backlash in some way against um, integrating psychedelics into you know, mainstream culture? It's something I kind of struggle with a lot because obviously I like psychedelics, but I have seen a lot of people, certainly in the ayahuasca world, who will... I mean, the first thing that happens, maybe not the first thing, one of the things that happens if you, if you take psychedelics, if you take ayahuasca, is that you can enter into kind of ego expansion level, uh, ego expansion mode. And we've often seen kind of uh, wannabe shamans uh, who think they're, think they're fantastic and become rather messianic. Now, in my tradition, which is Santa Daimi, there are kind of quite specific, I guess, prohibitions, for example, on proselytizing you're not allowed to run around saying dime is great you've got to take it you'd be you'd, you'd be much better for you if you took it all that kind of stuff you're kind of specifically forbidden from saying that and you're also specifically forbidden from inviting people so you're not allowed to invite in my tradition and you're not allowed to they in portuguese they say fazer propaganda you're not allowed to big it up Right. And part of that is because it's kind of troublesome when people become messianic in the indigenous traditions as well. You take your ayahuasca, but you don't take it once and then run around telling everybody you spend six months or you spend a year in the jungle on your own taking it or perhaps under supervision of another shaman. In fact, there's tribes which will say that next door tribe, the reason they've got so many witches, so much witchcraft is because they have dietas of only six months rather than a year. Right. So I don't want to sound all fuddy daddy about this, but just necking psychedelics is not really enough, I would say. I think we have to be quite careful about integrating that into our lives. And I think it's really quite important that we don't talk so much about how good psychedelics are, but that we lead by example, by being the kindest people that we can humanly be. Uh, the most responsible people that we can humanly be. And, you know, if people notice, gosh, you're a particularly interesting person, what is it you're doing that I'm not doing? Well, actually, it's acid. That's another way of going, that's another way of going at it. I like it. In the back door, though, right? Right in the back door. Yeah. Basically, a lot of resistance that people have against religion, of all manner of religion, is, is, is proselytizing, is, you know, putting it in your face, ramming it down your throat. And the same can be said for psychedelics, you know. We should go easy on people <laughs> and uh, allow them to make, you know, you can say, well, you know, this is what I do. But you don't, we don't want to be too in, in, in your face about these kind of things. And I think that that's an excellent way to wrap up. I think and that's an excellent way to finish up this conversation that we've had that has been fascinating. And I'm very grateful that you came on the show and shared this knowledge with us, Danny. It's been a an excellent hour or just over. Can you can you tell our listeners where they can find you and a little bit about the the books that you've written about these topics? 
Ah, brilliant. Okay, thank you. So my books, I've written two books. One of them is called Science Revealed. The other one is called Neuro Apocalypse. They're both out on Psychedelic Press. So there's cypressuk.com, I think it is, which is where you can check that one out. You can also get them on Amazon, but I would encourage you not to get them on Amazon because basically they are not so kind (laughs) <laughs> they're not as kind as we'd like them to be with their money. So if you're going to get it, then I would recommend you to get it on Cypress. I've got a bunch of articles on there. I've also got articles on my website, which is www.nemusend.co.uk. And there's a bunch of talks on there. What else is there? There's some stuff from Breaking Convention. I'd also recommend anyone and everyone to come to Breaking Convention in England. Tickets are selling out fast, so get on that one quickly. And that's June 30 to July 2nd. Is that correct? Those are the dates? Yeah, I think so. I don't I know. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's June 30. It is. It's June 30 to July 2nd, Breaking Convention in London. And Danny... Nemu? Is that how I pronounce your, your last uh, name? Rev- yeah, well, Reverend, Reverend Nemu. Nemu. Yeah, Nemu. everybody okay. needs a title and mine is Reverend. You know, I actually bought that on the internet for $15, but I used to, I used to, oh, I've, I've done many things, but I used to marry people in Japan, sometimes five couples a day, and I needed to be a proper reverend to do that. So I got myself ordained online. But well, yeah, Reverend Nemu. That's, a, that's another story in itself that uh, we might have to hear another time. So th- thanks again for, for sharing this time with us. Thanks very much, Paul. It's been brilliant. Thanks for listening to the Psychedelia Podcast with Paul Austin. Want more psychedelic information? Go to our website at thethirdwave.co and register for our email list and newsletter. Also, please consider donating to The Third Wave via our Patreon page. Donations make this podcast possible. Psychedelics have the potential to transform lives. By donating, you enable us to continue to inform people about the benefits of these powerful substances. 